We talked about ambition early on in the course, and ambition is not evil. In fact, it's a great leadership trait. But it may be a troubling dimension for Christian leaders. Why is that? I actually agree with that. I had to give some thought to that. But what is the goal? What's the reason for the drive? What's the reason for motivation? Is it for my glory, for my bank account, for my fame, recognition, wealth, my advancement? I think oftentimes, if I look back, it was for my family. Not an evil thing, a great thing. It's biblical to provide for your family and for the next generation. But what am I advancing? Am I advancing God's kingdom? Whose agenda am I following? The Bible says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Philippians 2. Nothing out of selfish ambition. Talking about humility, valuing others above ourselves. So whose ambition is it? Is it God-inspired? Is it insatiable? Greed is wanting more for selfish purposes, for excess, indulgence. Ambition is wanting success, accomplishment, improvement, achievement, and advancement. So I think greed, when ambition crosses over to greed, that's when there's danger. So what's wrong with ambition or success? Nothing. 2 Corinthians 9.8 says God is able to bless you abundantly. Here's the why. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That means he blesses us so we can bless others. That's God's agenda. So are we looking to God's agenda or man's? The most important thing a spiritual leader can do is to build his or her relationship with God, to seek God's will. Spiritual leadership is God's assignment. We can apply and even attempt to do the job, but he assigns, he calls. I love what Blackaby and Blackaby say here. Taking people where they are to where God wants them to be. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Acts 4.13. He uses ordinary unschooled people to do his will. You look at the disciples, ordinary fishermen. He shows himself strong on our behalf. God's plans dwarf our plans. There are times of preparation. Jim Collins said that most overnight success stories are 20 years in the making. So Matthew 25, 23 says, If you're faithful with a few things, the Lord will put you in charge of many. God's leaders are based on character. God wants to develop character worthy of spiritual leadership. How long will that take? Sometimes it takes a long time. So we must trust in God. We must obey His will. God rarely works the same way twice. His activity can't be reduced to a formula or seven steps to 13 ways. God has different priorities and values than we do. Those values, vision, goals, all those things which we've talked about that can be good can be replacements for God or substitutes. There should be some of God's revelation included in those. Most corporations have customer or goal-based objectives. Look at Chick-fil-A. And what they do, they close on Sundays. They're very vocal about their faith and family focus. So spiritual leadership is not an occupation, but a calling. This calling often takes time to discover and develop. David and Moses herded sheep in the wilderness. What if they discovered their gifts and passions too early? What if they tried to speed up God's timeline too quickly? They were being shaped. He may choose to have you do something or try something uncomfortable. For me, that was public speaking. I chose my college based on the fact that they didn't have speech classes because I was scared to death. I would call in sick in high school when there was a presentation due. But slowly, God prompted me to try teaching, to try and speak in front of people. And now it's my favorite thing to do. So be willing to try. You might find out that God has calling 
way beyond where you think yours is. The Western world is mesmerized by size and image. Leaders lead followers. Great leaders lead leaders. So your job is to multiply leaders, but seek God's heart first. God's leadership traits are different than some of those charismatic, transformational, heroic leadership traits that we talked about. Moses wasn't a natural leader. He was a poor public speaker. He had Aaron step in for him. He didn't delegate well. He had anger issues. He murdered someone. But he was humble. Henry Varley challenged D.L. Moody and said, The world is yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. So God's looking for men and women to surrender all, to follow him, to be humble, and to have him shape you as a leader. Many leaders make commitments, but they don't participate in absolute surrender. You can accomplish your own objectives and yet miss God's will for your team, for your life. So having discussions, having times of prayer to seek God's will, to have that communion and fellowship with our leader helps to bring the Spirit's wisdom, power, and His agenda. It makes His voice louder and the distractions softer. One of my favorite verses is John 3.30. More of Him, less of me. That's a good goal. So I'm excited about the great influence that you are going to have. Maybe you already are having a great influence, but I believe that this class and you making some changes, seeking God more, that your influence will continue to grow and grow. I want to share this simple thing that I believe from Blackaby and Blackaby called the Leader's Influence. Seven simple points. Maybe they're not simple, but they are powerful. Leaders can have the greatest influence if they pray. If they work hard. If they communicate effectively. If they serve. If you maintain a positive attitude, no matter what. If you encourage others. And if you focus on what's important. Putting your time, your talent, your resources towards the things that are important, focusing on those things. One last thing that I really enjoyed in the Blackaby and Blackaby book was their take on leaders and decision-making. Decision-making is a very important and critical part of a leader's job. So including the Holy Spirit's guidance and wisdom in that process can do nothing but help you. James 1.5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who will give it to him generously without finding fault. So asking for that wisdom, seeking the Lord's will, being teachable, being willing to learn from your followers, being willing to learn from others, knowing your history, knowing the things that will be obstacles or temptations or weaknesses or challenges, having your own SWOT analysis, being self-aware so that you can surround yourself with others that will help with the future. Planning, taking time to plan so you don't have to redo, rework, and be flexible in those plans. Write them in pencil because God may change them. But be accountable not just to your spouse, to your family, to your boss, but to God, to His Word. Accept the consequences, accept correction. Nobody likes rebuke or correction or improvements. I always hate that part of my performance reviews, and I tend to rise up and get a little bit ticked off sometimes. But that's an area of work for me. Admitting your mistakes being humble and being willing to do that. It's powerful with followers. And then standing by your decisions. Sometimes you may have to change them or tweak them, but stand by your convictions, your morals, your values. And if you have made a decision that you believe in, even if there's turmoil, stick with it. These are some things that will help you in your decision making. Thanks. Have a great day.